issue of the Holocaust, I think, is really ironic because, you know, so much literature has been expended in the pursuit of exposing Hitler and the Holocaust and, and the terrible tragedy that occurred with the Jews where six million people perished. What most people in this country fail to realize is that the model for that was here, was the treatment of our Indian people, was the model for Hitler. And he said so. He wrote it down. And he said that the prison camps here were the model for the prison camps. Also the whole notion of turning the people against themselves within the prison camps and keeping them busy with each other so that they couldn't escape or didn't have other ideas was also born here and he copied it. He thought it was a very good plan and he really admired Andrew Andrew Jackson. You know, so it's a little known part of history but it is a reality and uh, nobody's ever really addressed it. Nobody's ever really talked about the Holocaust here. I mean there were conservative conservative figures, 19 million Indian people living in North America, 19 million. And by 1970, there were 260,000. They didn't move to Hawaii, you know, or they didn't go to Sweden. Where did they go? They are gone. They were gone, killed. Murdered. But 19 million people. Well, that's not a Holocaust. I feel that this country doesn't understand historically what happened to its indigenous people. They see it on television and they read it in the books, but they really don't see it in the practical sense. It points directly toward the racism of this country, of the white person, of the dominant society, of manipulation of the environment, uh, of its people. To, to, to us, to the white man, we're just uh, kind of like a cactus on the trail. You chop it away and get it out of the way so you can keep walking down the trail and seeing what, what the beauty you want to see. I think that one of my goals is to have our people look at themselves and stop dancing for white people and saying, we're so pretty. I want us to say, look what you've done to us. Look what you've taken. Look at the beauty we had and still have to offer you and stop treating us like subhuman human beings because we don't, we don't deserve it and we don't need it. For more than 500 years, American Indian people have been subjected to the ever-changing whims of the white man who with sword in one hand and Bible in the other swept across this land like a plague of locusts. What the people of the United States did not know was that their so-called enlightened nation was setting an example that would be followed in the 20th century by some of the worst butchers known to man, including Adolf Hitler. In his biography of Hitler, John Tolan wrote, Hitler's concept of concentration camps as well as the practicality of genocide owed much. John Tolan wrote, Hitler's concept of concentration camps as well as the practicality of genocide owed much, so he claimed, to his studies of United States history. And he often praised to his inner circle the efficiency of America's extermination by starvation and uneven combat of the red savages who could not be tamed by captivity. In their efforts to deal with the original inhabitants of this land, the European and then the American governments tried many different approaches. First they tried subjugation. Then when that failed, extermination. And when that wasn't totally successful, 
Then came the reservations. And the land set aside for reservations in the 1800s was generally the most worthless land that could be found. Indians were relocated to these lands for as long as the grass grows and the rivers flow. Unless, like in the Black Hills of South Dakota, valuable mineral resources are discovered on that land, and then the Indians are uprooted and relocated again. The enrollment issue originated with uh, when the government set up reservations. They signed up the Indians who were assigned to that particular reservation. They took a role, as it were, at that time. Everybody was given a number so that they could identify the people who were reservation-bound Indians because reservations and the inception were no more than glorified concentration camps. Indians were forbidden to leave them. And so you were given your tribal identity right then and there by the United States government. It's another labeling system. Uh, there probably was an importance for it at the time, you know, to find out numbers of uh, indigenous people. And uh, now it's almost being used against us. And uh, for a lot of the Native American Indian, whatever you want to call them, don't have a number to rely on. And uh, for assistance, for even being considered a part of us, of the rest of us, they're, they're put out, they're put aside, pushed away, and saying, you don't qualify, even though they may have a higher blood quantum than myself. And so I don't see it where, where it's being used in a way to be beneficial to us. It's just being, it's just a way of being controlled again. You know, when you, when you take prisoners, you, you write down their names and give them a number. That way you can keep track of them. It's a very simple process. It's done in every war. It's done in every, uh, every time one group of people conquers another, conquers another group of people. Uh, when I was younger, I was extremely angry about it, you know. Now, there's a sadness because things will never be the way that they used to be. It will never happen. So I just try and work as hard as I can to retain as much of my culture for myself, for future generations. But I'm never going to let them forget it. I don't think that this country will ever really heal itself until it answers the question of what it did to its indigenous people. But confining Indians to reservations wasn't enough for many hawkish political and military leaders. Nothing short of total annihilation of the American Indian was acceptable in their eyes. Colonel John Chivington, known as the Fighting Parson and head of the 1st Colorado Cavalry, told a gathering of church deacons, It is simply not possible for Indians to obey or understand a treaty. To kill them is the only way we will ever have peace and quiet. Later that same year, he led 700 soldiers on a surprise raid against a peaceful band of Cheyenne who were camped along Colorado's Sand Creek. Just before the dawn attack, he told his men, Kill them all! Children as well! Nits make lice! Four hundred people, mostly women, children, and elders, were murdered that day as an American flag and a white flag of peace flew high over the camp's tallest teepee. As tribe after tribe was successfully depopulated, demoralized, and imprisoned on reservations, Political winds shifted, and extermination began to fall out of favor. Assimilation became a new byword of a concerned citizenry, and so an educational model to make Indians into imitation white men was proposed. The centerpiece of this plan was the Indian boarding school system designed by former Indian fighter Captain Richard Pratt. His motto, kill the Indian, save the man. 
was the central philosophy which destroyed Indian families and societies by sexually violating man was the central philosophy which destroyed Indian families and societies by sexually violating and brainwashing generations of Indian children into believing that their language, culture, clothing, and their very identity was evil. In actuality, the effect of the boarding schools was far more devastating and far-reaching than its creators ever conceived. It is now recognized that the boarding school experience has affected multiple generations of Indian people with such symptoms as alcoholism, drug abuse, incest, sexual abuse, and other major dysfunctions. Almost every Indian person alive today, no matter how successful, carries the residual psychological scars of yesterday and must grapple with the question, when it's all over, will I be Indian? or white. Uh, I grew up with the signs, uh, no Indians or dogs allowed, uh, and had to abide by those signs, not being able to go into places. And so from the very time I was very small, I think that uh, I, I learned that uh, you had to be strong in order to be an Indian. How do I define an Indian? That's a that's a political question that's very difficult to deal with. Traditionally, the Apache people uh, didn't have a definition of who was Indian. I'm the only person that doesn't claim to be American Indian because American Indian is only 500 years old, and but I was here before Columbus. So <clears throat> that doesn't make me American Indian. So I'm a non-Indian, no, I'm a non-American. Today, America, nobody knows what America is, and nobody knows what Indian means. So the only Indian that was defined by Congress is uh, primitive or North American Indian. But then what is primitive? Anything that goes by itself is primitive. But when you put a fence around it, it's not primitive anymore. So then what is Indian? Now if the Congress changes tune to what is Indian to who is Indian, so only half will be regarded as Indian. So American Indian cannot be defined as a nation. So American Indian, as long as we're labeled American Indian, American Indian will be written never, never, and never be recognized as a nation. So I think there's a another way to look at that whole issue of what is Indian and what, you know, the word or what we call ourselves. It's en Dios, meaning in God, that the people that he encountered were godlike, were, were very pure. And uh, that M. Dios became Indio, which became Indian. We have lost so much blood, and so many of us have died uh, over the name Indian, that he says we've earned it. And we've earned that name with our blood. I find the word Native American offensive to me. It's like, here's a nation of people that enslaved my people, stole my culture, tried to beat it out of me, and now they're going to include me. And I don't mean to sound unpatriotic, I'm a veteran, but they're saying now you can call yourself a Native American. I'm not, I'm an Aboriginal indigenous person. I know I'm not white. I tried to be white, and uh, I couldn't do it, and they didn't want me. Because I'm not white. I'm culturally Apache. I relate to my tribe closer than any other human beings in this world. I know who I am, and I know my blood. Uh, I don't have to read in a book that somebody wrote at some fort some, somewhere along uh, back in history to tell me who I am. And I don't have to have a number to tell me that I am an Indian. Well, to me, I don't care if I'm 164th uh, or 
300 and whatever, or what are one one thousand something. There's a lot of our little kids that are oh four, four different. It could be four different tribes. And uh, well, now which one of these means more to you? There's one of them there that means a lot more to you than the others. I feel being Indian is not being part. If you're Indian, you're Indian. You're not just um, you know a part of a part white or a part uh, Hispanic or anything else. You're Indian because that's how you feel when you grow up. And you have an Apache mother, or a Comanche, or whatever. If she's 15 tribes, but she sings the lullaby to you of whatever tribe she feels, I mean, she knows, then you're going to feel the dominance of that in your life. I mean, she knows. Then you're going to feel the dominance of that in your life. It's kind of like that's going to be your choice. As in people, we, we have uh, the responsibility to care for our own, to care for our young, take them in no matter what blood they have. If they're ours, they're ours. That's a simple answer. You, know, there, you can't say, you aren't enough of me, so find your own way. That's not what it's all about. We, we brought them into this world. So what happens when this young guy comes up to the drum and he looks black and he says, my father is such and such and my mother is such and such and I'm Indian. What do you say? To, and I want to learn the song. What do you say to him? And he said, you better make a place on the drum for him and have him sit because he's one of us. My mother was only uh, half Apache, but that's always, I've never felt like I was anything but Apache. We've always, because my father was uh, always singing and always teaching us about Apache, so I felt like we were Apaches and we, that's all we were. And I think my mother felt that way too because she never said anything about being, being white. It was always Apache, everything she did. She made dresses and she beaded and made purses and all kinds of things and she made those and, and they were Apache and that's what she wanted to teach us to dance Apache, to sing Apache and that's what I'd like to give to my children to help them to realize that they're, they're Apache and one of the things we went to was something in Oklahoma and uh, there were all these people in and their minks you know and their tuxedos and their formals and everything and, uh, and my daughter asked me, she said, Mama how do you feel? You're, you're wearing an Apache dress, you know, and all these other people are all dressed up. I said, I feel like I'm the most beautiful person here. I said, because I'm Apache. And that, that's the way I feel. Somebody asked me one time, what is it like being a native person, and especially being a person of mixed blood? It's a constant explanation of my culture. I mean, I'm totally amazed at how much the non-Indian population knows about my existence. As far as tribal identity is concerned, this is, for many years, back in the times when this hatred and hostility about American Indians in our own country was so prevalent that many people who left the reservations, native people who left the reservations hid their tribal identity so that they could be accepted by a, the dominant society. Because Indians were being relocated to the cities by the thousands to empty the reservations so that the termination policy could be affected, we suddenly had an explosion of urban Indians. The urban Indians oftentimes did not, once they had children, they would not enroll them with their own tribe. They didn't take the time or the effort or, as one Indian said, what's it worth to be an Indian? In the 1950s, the federal government instituted yet another new Indian policy known as termination. The purpose of this policy? 
to eliminate tribal governments and tribal lands, along with any vestige of tribal identity, so that the Red Nation would become part of America's great melting pot. A major part of this program launched another relocation campaign which offered training, jobs, and a part of the American dream to any Indian who would leave the reservation and move to the city. What most Indians who signed up for the relocation program found instead was isolation, alienation, and further disintegration of their culture and identity. And so this policy became one more chapter of the American Holocaust. But relocation is not a dead policy of the distant past. It is an active policy of the present day. By order of the U.S. government, more than 12,000 Navajo people have been forced in the last 25 years to move from their traditional homelands on Big Mountain in Arizona to be resettled one more time on land nobody wants. Contaminated desert bottomlands of the Rio Puerco, downstream from the largest radiation spill in American history. The reason for relocation this time? The discovery of one of the largest coal deposits ever found in North America. The most recent law which strengthened and accelerated this forced removal was introduced by Senator John McCain and signed into law in 1998. Because as Indians were not pulling together, we're so fragmented and uh, still left the white way to break us up, make us weak. And uh, we are strong, but we're, we're so far apart from one another, make us weak. And uh, we are strong, but we're, we're so far apart from one another and can't come together on the issues, would just, just as soon go their way and say, oh, you take care of it. We exclude, 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 cut out, don't let in. Where is that tradition? What's that tradition from? It's from Europe. So we're being good white people when we do that, when we're being exclusive, but we're not being what our ancestors were. Uh, this world loses six million Jewish people and the world feels sorry. The world loses 50 million indigenous people in this, this continent and the world doesn't care. It's ongoing. And I say that with a great deal of sadness because a lot of the times the Holocaust is perpetuated by our own. And it's not necessarily the outsiders. I mean, we've learned our lessons well. We've learned how to be divisive. We've learned how to, to take the tools of colonization and use them on ourselves. And we've done that very well, thank you. And the Holocaust goes on today. People are dying all over the world. There are Geronimo's all over the world fighting for their people. And dying sad. All I know is, is all these years of what Western civilization has tried to do to indigenous people that we still endure. I'm proud of my people, and I'm proud of who I am and what, what they did and what they stood for. You survived. <laughs> no, we've always survived and we're still surviving. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
Walking in beauty, our children are sacred. 